Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome, everyone, to Sports Spectrum. This is Jason Romano. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode number 89, and we do appreciate you joining us, checking us out wherever you are on this fine day. As always, you can download and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, our YouTube channel. You can go there and subscribe as well, and every single podcast is found there, as well as all of our content over at sportspectrum.com, where you can become a member for just $36.00. For an entire year, it gets our quarterly magazine as well as helps fund all of the content that we produce here at Sports Spectrum, including Football Sunday, which reached over a million people this past January, as well as the increase and as well as Sports Spectrum's podcast and our content that we're putting every single day at SportsSpectrum.com. Just $36. Go check it out. Subscribe and become a member and partner with us here at Sports Spectrum. Today's guest, he is Matt Deggs. He is the Sam Houston State baseball coach. Now, that might not sound familiar to you. That name, Matt Deggs, might be, you know, uh, a name that you don't know. But when you go back to YouTube and you put his name into YouTube in the search engine and find some of the videos that he's been a part of, you'll say, oh yeah, that's the guy from last year at the press conference. And that's exactly who Matt Deggs is. He is the Sam Houston State baseball coach who had the famous press conference after his team lost in the NCAA regionals last year in 2017, 40 million people viewed this press conference after he did it. And it went viral of all virals, if you can. And it it changed his life in a lot of ways and gave him a platform that he never really uh, was expecting, I guess. Although he did say that when he came to Sam Houston state, that he knew God was going to do some pretty great things with him. I'm not sure he knew uh, how great or how big he would use Uh, Coach Diggs in this press conference and just in his career, but he did. And to the point where Matt has written a new book called 15 to 28, a story of God's love, power, and redemption. Uh, There's a great quote on the cover from Jace Robertson from Duck Dynasty and Duck Commander. And it says, it's amazing to witness the transformational power of the gospel as Jesus works through those who seek him. And this book features that journey for Coach Matt Diggs and the journey he has taken in and out of college baseball and finding and learning to trust in God's plan and who Jesus is and what he has done to redeem all of us, including Coach Deggs. And uh, this podcast is a lot of fun because you get to hear Coach Deggs' story, but you get to hear uh, uh, from a man who has been completely transformed from the inside out because of the name of Jesus. And so, and we'll also uh, bring that press conference into you as well and be able to play that for you and let you hear that and just a cool opportunity here to catch up with coach Diggs. i hope you enjoy it let's get right to it sam houston state baseball coach without further ado here he is on episode number 89 he is matt Diggs. matt welcome to the show thanks jason it's great to connect with you appreciate you having me on yeah great to talk to you and and so much has happened even just in the last year for you with writing a book and obviously all the success you had as the coach at sam houston state let's start with the book it's called 15 to 28 a story of god's love power and redemption and there's so much in the book that i know we'll talk about during our time together just through your journey but tell us why you wanted to write this book right now well that's a great question. And it's an, it's an obvious question. You know, the, the thing about the book is this, is that it, it goes back to the press conference and, you know, we, we had this press conference at the end of our year and, and, you know, it's been seen worldwide 40, 50 million times and just the overwhelming support and emails and texts and letters, just, you know, hundreds and thousands of them, uh, of the impact that that had and the way the press conference came about was just God nudging my heart to tell the story. And, uh, so had an opportunity to open the door to that story in the press conference and saw how hungry and thirsty people were for the absolute truth and, uh, for some, for some hope and, and, uh, for, for guys to stand up in the midst of a heartbreaking defeat and proclaim the glory of God, uh, whether they admit it or not, people were hungry for that. And so I uh, made up my mind and connected with the right guy, Matt Morse, and just made up my mind that I was going to tell the story through a, essentially 
a quasi autobiography, which is my testimony and, and, uh, the, the story of 15 to 28 and God's made big impact through that book. And it's, it's helped change a lot of people. It's exciting to see. I'm looking forward to reading it. Looking forward to hearing, uh, feedback from everybody who reads this book, but tell us what 15 to 28 exactly means. What is that? Yeah, it's a unique title that I just, you know, Lord put on my heart. It, 15 had been my number forever. And it was kind of if if baseball was my identity, then 15 is what I was hiding behind, so to speak. And uh, that was the, the shield for the facade. And uh, I was fired, spent 430 days outside of the game and, uh, you know, was broken, lost, drunk, a mess. My life was in the gutter. And uh, there was only one school in the entire country. Of all the schools, high school, junior college, professional, D1, you name it, of all, of everywhere, there was one school that uh, was willing to give me another opportunity, and that was UL Lafayette. And uh, by the grace of God, uh, the Lord connected me with Tony Robichaux, one of the greatest men I've ever met, the head coach there at UL. And uh, When I got there, they only had one number left. And when you don't have a job and then you have a job, <laughs> you're not really in a bargaining position. That's and, right. Uh, so... I gladly took 28, and that's when the miracles started to happen. That's awesome. 15 to 28 in bookstores now. You can pick it up, and we'll talk a little bit more about that journey. We're talking to Matt Deggs here, Sam Houston State baseball coach on the Sports Spectrum podcast. And Coach Matt, I believe, I believe it's important for people to recognize when God gives them a platform to point people people back to him. You did exactly that. You talked about the post-game interview from 2017 in the press conference. It goes viral. Let's just paint the picture for a minute. Your team makes the Cinderella run all the way to the NCAA Super Regionals before losing to Florida State, and it's not a pretty loss. It's 17 nothing. After the game, you start your presser with some comments on the team and the players, and it goes bonkers. Like you said, super viral, 40 to 50 million people. But I believe it went viral because of the way you exemplify what you value even more than just winning and losing. For years, I was a transactional coach. What can I get? What can I get? And... Uh... When you get fired, it humbles you. I spent 430 days outside the game. Everybody asked, uh, you know, you were here with the Aggies in 2011. No, I wasn't. I was fired. And uh, I just sit there and watch the Aggies play. And God has brought me full circle and changed my life. I was dead and he saved me. And so I'm a transformational coach now. It's not about wins or losses. It's about love. It's about building men, building relationships that'll last forever. I got a second chance. This guy's a second chance guy. This guy's a second chance guy. This guy's a second chance guy. We're about building people up. You know, it's not Mission Omaha. It's Mission Build and Save Lives. And that's what we're in the business of doing. This is the most unselfish, selfless, group of men and families I've ever been around. This is rare in this day and age. Rare in a, in a microwave society where it's all about entitlement and all about when do I get to play. This guy's playing with a broken left hand right now. Nobody knows that. His left hand's broken. Last year he played with a broken wrist. Last year Taylor Bean played with a broken thumb. I won't even get into the rest of the litany of injuries that are going on with this team right now. Andrew Frije just walked up to me in the dugout and said, give my last at bat to Nate Van Dyke. Robbie Rojas gave up his last at bat so Hunter uh, Sutherland could catch. You know, there is no greater honor. And this is, uh, I could preach. It's what I wish our, our country would get back to. There's no greater honor than the sacrifice for a brother. And that encapsulates and embodies this team to a T. That's why they're so lovable. Did you know when you when you said what you said? I wonder because I always I love when I see people, you know, and they're on a big platform. The Super Bowl recently, and the Eagles win, and and their coach goes up, and he's being interviewed by Dan Patrick on NBC, and he just proclaims Jesus Christ as his savior. So I wonder for you, did you know what was happening when you started sharing those words, sort of being intentional about that, or did it just kind of come off the tongue? Well, that, the answer to that's twofold, Jason, and the fact that 
I, when I speak now, I tell people even today, I could not repeat to you what I said in that, that press conference. I just <laughs> don't remember it. It was the power of the Lord and the Holy spirit. And, uh, so what came out just came out now, the way the entire thing came about was, yeah, we were, you know, in the conferences and the school's first ever super regional. We had done something that people thought was seemingly impossible. And we had lost, we went in there fully expecting to win. And we got in a, in a firefight, so to speak, the first day and got a three run lead in the seventh and, and two outs. And they came back and tied it with two outs and then walked us off in the ninth. And we left out of there that day. No one, you know, a couple of things. We had missed a great opportunity, one. But two, we really thought we'd come back and win the next two games. We had kind of seen the lay of the land. It wasn't too much for us. And uh, the next morning, I was, I'd woke up early. Kathy was still in bed in the hotel, and I was doing my devotional. And the Lord just spoke strongly to my heart, tell your story. Hmm. And I thought immediately, because I'm still very selfish and opportunistic, egotistical, that person still lives inside of me. I thought immediately oh my God, we're going to Omaha. And I said, Lord, as soon as we get to Omaha, I'll tell the whole thing. And, you know, I'm not the fastest guy, but it wasn't until it was 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 to nothing in the dugout that the light bulb went off and I realized, oh, you want me to tell this right now. And Hmm. so uh, my logic was success in the earthly standards, the Lord's logic was us standing up in defeat and proclaiming his name. Hmm. And uh, so the press conference actually starts off with the boys talking about how special we are to each other. And it wasn't until the very end when a local reporter asked what this team means to you. And, you know, that was like the Lord hanging a curveball right there. I mean, he put it right over the middle of the plate and, I knew at that moment I was about to swing as hard as I could. How many times have you watched that, I wonder? I mean, obviously, it's one thing for 40 to 50 million people to watch it, but I wonder, if do you find yourself sometimes, maybe it was over the summer or the fall, and you're just kind of going through YouTube and it just pops up, and you're like, let me just see what I, I said never, again. I uh, never watched it. Really? Uh, no, <laughs> but, but I, you know, I never intentionally sat down and watched it, but what I do is... I've spoken a bunch since then all over and, uh, every, every speech they lead with the two minute version of that press conference. And it's just a great lead in. It's a great conversation starter. And, uh, it just opens up people's hearts and eyes immediately. You talked in that presser about how you were a transactional coach for many years and then how God brought you full circle and changed your life and now made you a transformational coach. I find it ironic that the Lord gave you such a giant platform to shine and point people back to him during maybe your lowest point in the season after that loss. Tell me about the difference between being a transactional coach and being a transformational coach. So when I was still at UL Lafayette, and we had come off this incredible run in 2014, we had become the first mid-major ever to finish the regular season as the consensus number one ranked team in the nation. That team was 58 and 10. Hmm. And we lost narrowly to Ole Miss and the super regional to go to Omaha. And I was having one last meeting with my hitters and I didn't know I was leaving yet. And the Lord put on my heart, Isaiah 43, one, don't be afraid for I've redeemed you. I have summoned you. I call you by name. And and then he spoke to me that I'm going to take you and put you on just a little bit bigger stage. And once again, <laughs> I thought SEC, <laughs> right. big job, and uh, it wasn't until truly your eyes are open, you know, because the number one job of the enemy is to blind you, and so I lived a lot of years blind, but now my eyes are, trust me, they're fully open, and I see stuff, and it wasn't until that press conference that it dawned on me that this is the little bit bigger stage that he was talking about, and uh, when I mentioned transactional versus transformational, you know, when you sit out 430 days, you got to know this. I was already talented. I had already won and, and been a part of teams that had won at a big level. Uh, but I was super transactional. In other words, you know, is constant quid pro quo. What's in it for me? And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get you here. You get me there. And uh, that's 
when you sit out 430 days, you have an opportunity to learn really and truly one word, and that's perspective. And I realized a couple of things. Number one, they're going to win with or without you. I mean, I was fired and watched the team that I had helped put together and coach for years win the Big 12, won the Big 12 tournament, uh, host and win a regional, go to Florida State, and they won a super regional, and then go to Omaha. Hmm. And so I realized that they're going to win with or without whoever. I don't care how good you are. Okay. And then number two, I realized this is that you'll always, as a coach, as a leader, as a man, need them way more than they need you. So you need to be thankful for them and you need to build them, mold them and shape them. And that's your mission. That's your job. And so sitting out, I learned some perspective on those things. I was given another opportunity and slowly over time, the Lord opened my eyes to see these things and start to put them into action. And if you look at our last five years, man, they've been remarkable. I go from a coach that bears little to no fruit to a coach that through a life of faith, sacrifice, obedience, service, bears great fruit in everything that I touch and in every, you know, and those around me. And uh, just go back and backtrack from 2013 to now and see all the fruit the Lord has placed in our life. You talk about the fruit, but I wonder for your faith, because I know your faith is, is vital and it's probably the center of who you are right now. When did that start to take shape? Even before the fall, you know, you talk about the 430 days. I wonder before that where faith was for you, maybe because you were still you were in your late 30s, early 40s when that sort of fall took place and you were out of baseball for a while. Tell me about before that, like growing up, faith. Well, you, you got to know that. Thing. I was saved when I was 10, you know, yeah. convicted by the Holy Spirit right there in the Baptist church and the Holy Spirit grabbed me by the collar and yanked me down the, the uh, aisle there up to the front, saved, baptized that evening. And, and so I knew Christ and rededicated my life again in 2004, uh, surrounded with some incredible mentors, a guy named Josh Foliart at the University of Arkansas and was, was really blessed with the opportunity to learn the word and the Bible. And, uh, you know, I didn't drink when I went to A&M. It wasn't all of that happened slowly over time through deception and pressure and self-medication and this and that until you look up, dude, and you're lost. Mm. And it's like being lost at sea, man. And that doesn't happen. That doesn't just happen for a while. You can see the shoreline and through distractions or pressures or this or that you look up and Oh my goodness. You can't see anything. Where am I? Hmm. And so it was this fog, you're blinded and you're lost. And it's a dark, hopeless feeling. Casting crown sings a song called slow fade. I don't know if you've heard that song. Does that ring sort of true in the way that it was for you? It wasn't just like a, an immediate fall. It was a slow fade. Yes. And the, you know, becoming lost is it's very slow. The enemy is very patient and so it was kind of twofold in the fact that becoming lost was very slow and also being totally redeemed was very slow. That was not like it happened like that. You know, people think it's this aha moment and it's not, you know, when, when you tie your identity to baseball, okay, you tie your identity to something of this world, be it the, be it baseball, the stock market, owning a business, money, fame, you name it, all of that stuff is super temporary. And if you're not running spiritually on a full tank, mentally, physically, spiritually, and that is taken from you, it's going to create this huge void in your life that can only be filled by the things of this world, lust, greed, money, alcohol, gambling, drugs, you name it. That's the only thing that you'll run to. And so when you're lost, and your identity is tied to what you do instead of who you are as a man, there really and truly is no escape. It's got you. And so it took years and years after, after being fired. You know, when I was fired, because my identity was so fully submersed and ensconced and, and just wrapped up in, in what I did, it was akin to the death of the closest person you know. Mm -hmm. And so I would go through the five stages of grief seemingly all at the same time. 
And as soon as I thought one was gone, you revert back to another one and then they all hit. And so I was filled with anger and rage and bitterness and guilt and shame. And it wasn't until we went to the Lord has a sense of humor. He, he took us to Lafayette, Louisiana, the, the drinking capital of the United States of America to strip us of everything and, and lead a life of humility and simplicity and, and perspective and, and to look back and to see where we were and now where he's brought us and, and to live this simple life surrounded by incredible people and family and players and, and to, to, to slowly start to forgive yourself and lay it all down uh, was that's where the healing really started to take place. How how low did it get? What was the what was the, they talk about rock bottom a lot with addiction? I wrote the book with my dad about forgiveness, and I remember his rock bottom point. I wonder for you, was there a rock bottom moment, or was it again a bunch of different things that just kind of spiraled you down to the bottom? Oh, trust me, there was many times where family, friends, etc., would proclaim this as rock bottom, and. Uh, you know, I'm the type of guy that can always find a way to go lower or higher. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't know that there was ever uh, that, you know, moment as much as, you know, I think back to, I call them kick in the, kick in the gut moments, you know, uh, watching A&M baseball from my parents' couch play in Omaha, a team that you were so fully a part of, mm -hmm. uh, and you're watching them as a 39 year old from your parents' couch because you're kicked out of your home and you've been fired. Uh, that will that will humble you in a hurry. Uh, loading 18 wheelers full of cattle feed, horse feed, deer corn because you've blown through your all your retirement. You have no money. Nobody will hire you. You've got to work at a feed mill after you were the associate head coach at Texas A&M. That'll humble you. And through it all, I still didn't get it. And, uh, you know, really and truly, Jason, I had proven through it all that I couldn't quit drinking or living as an enemy of the cross for my family, for God, for myself. I couldn't do it. And for my career, it wasn't until I was at UL, you know, for over a year that one day I, I I just stood back in what we call a pack meeting. We have these pack meetings with our hitters a couple, two or three times a day. And I started looking at these boys and I said, you know what? His daddy's in prison. His mom's an alcoholic. His mom's an alcoholic. This, this child's mom's been married four or five times. This kid lost his brother. And I realized, you know what? Lord has placed me in a spot where I am surrounded by brokenness. And I'm the chief broken one among them. Hmm. And I made up my mind right then and there that I would never let these dudes down again. And I haven't had a drop of alcohol since then and uh, carried over from those boys to the boys that I'm entrusted with at, at Sam Houston State University. And I think that was the true transformational moment when, you know what, I'm done being transactional. I'm now going to build these guys. I'm going to, I'm going to teach these guys. I'm going to share with these guys. I'm going to love with these guys. I'm going to cry with these guys. I'm going to compete with these guys where I totally let the false bravado and identity that was so fully submersed in the things of this world go. And from that moment, they're going to see the real me warts and all, and we're going to love each other and we're going to do this thing. Isn't that when you see real healing begin is when you start to tear down you know, sort of the, the walls that we put up in our, in our lives, you know, when we really start to peel away the mask and open ourselves up and you really realize that others are, are going through similar things just like we are. Doesn't that when you start to see that moment kind of take place? Well, I really think it comes down to one word, Jason, and, and I think that word is humility. When, when yeah. we live, when we truly can live a life of humility, Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in due time. Hmm. When we can truly let go to us and give it all to him, there's a certain absolute freedom in that. And there's a boldness in that. You know, people think meekness or humility or these things are weakness. But you got to remember when you're weak, you are strong. 
And, you yes. know, Paul, Paul says it in Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And so when we're truthful with ourselves, and then truthful with others, and so through truth and humility, there's absolute freedom, man. And then when you realize that, yeah, I was dead, now I'm alive, and not only am I alive, I'm free. There's a power and there's a danger in that. And I'm, when I say danger, I mean good danger. Mm. You just, you, you're unafraid. Yeah. We're talking to Coach Matt Deggs here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast and Houston State baseball coach. I want to talk about second chances. You've, you've referenced it a, a, quite a few times. But that 430 days of being away from baseball and then the second chance comes. Give us a little glimpse and go a little deeper into what that looked like and how that second chance came about for you. Well, the most powerful force on earth, in my opinion, is, re is redemption and the, the gift of a second chance. You know, anybody that's been scared or come close to dying or, uh, you know, I've walked away from a car wreck or whatever it might be, you understand the power in that. And for me, it was crazy. You know, baseball jobs in college baseball don't come open during the spring. And uh, I was selling pharmaceuticals. I was miserable. Uh, my life was a mess. And I would still continue to pray, Lord, please bless me with the job this spring. Bless me with the job this spring, please, Lord. And uh, it was February, late February of 2012, and I had just finished up my day as a pharmaceutical rep and uh, was actually walking into a convenience store to buy a six-pack of Tall Boys. And that was the life I was living then. And, and uh, right as I'm opening the door to the store, one of my buddies that I'd coach with at A&M that was out of baseball at the time, he lived in South Louisiana. He called and he said, dude, you're never going to guess what the hitting coach at UL Lafayette's leaving. And so they're going to have an opening next week for a hitting coach and a recruiting coordinator. Well, I had known those guys at UL for a long time. We kind of cut our teeth together and, uh, you know, Anthony Babineau and I cut our teeth together. Coach Robichaux was known by everybody. And they had competed against us in our regional in 2007 at A&M. And so there's a little backstory there. And I told Talbot, when he told me that job was open, I said, hey, dude, call them right now and tell them. This is how desperate I was. Hmm. I said, call them right now and tell them I will come there for free. Wow. And he's like, you got it. And we hung up, and uh, this is the power of addiction. The Lord's given me a little glimmer of hope. Instead of closing the door to the convenience store and walking back the other way, I went in, purchased a beer, doused all of them, and continued to pray for a miracle. Hmm. As sick as that sounds, that's uh, that's the life I was living. Yeah, And so... Uh, we were connected with uh, the UL guys and they remembered me obviously because we ran the pack and, and the pack offense. And, and when we competed against them in the championship game of our regional, we had to switch dugouts. That's the way the NCAA did it back then. And uh, so they were in our dugout and coach Robichaux is kind of a, a pack rat and always searching for knowledge. He walked in our clubhouse and we had the whole pack mentality posted on the board in the clubhouse and he read and remembered the entire thing. And so when he found out I was available, we sat down and met in the Holiday Inn in San Marcos, Texas for about four hours. And uh, he's a man that believes in second chances first and foremost, but he was also super interested in the pack. Mm. And uh, that's how that came about. I, I had gone from being the associate head coach at A&M to now I was going to get a second chance for $42,500. <laughs> Well, you would have done it for free, <laughs> right? I was serious when I said I would do it for free. And, and yeah. Anthony Babineau and his wife were gracious enough because it was the middle of the school year. Our house didn't sell for 17 months in mm -hmm. College Station. And so my family stayed behind. I lived with the assistant coach, Anthony Babineau and his wife and two beautiful little girls for like three or four months in their spare bedroom. And uh, jumped in, started coaching that 2012 team, started recruiting. That that team was not very good. They finished 23 and 30, hit like 260. And that set the stage for the most improbable run that, that most people had seen in a long time over the next two years, 2013 and 2014. 
You mentioned the pack a few times. Tell us about the mentality of what the pack is. For the strength of the pack is the wolf, but the strength of the wolf is the pack. So it's a mentality. And the mentality is this, Jason. We need your skill set. We need your personality. We need you. But in return, you also need us. You need the team. And nothing comes before team in anything we do. And so we'd always been successful over the years, always hit, always hit big, always scored a lot of runs. But it wasn't until I got to A&M in like 05, 06, me and Rob Childress got there together and we got dumped on our butt that first year. We didn't hit. There wasn't a lot of buy-in. And, and I was scratching my head the entire summer of 06 and uh, with that team we had inherited because I thought, man, I can really coach. I thought, man, I'll just get these guys to buy in and do what we've always done. We were both coming from very successful programs in Arkansas and Nebraska and nothing really worked. I knew I knew what we did, but I'd never defined it. And to 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 really master your craft, you need to define, write down, label, identify, and have definitions for everything you do. And so I scratched my head that entire summer and I was literally sitting down at the house one night watching a documentary over wolves and packs of wolves. And I realized that you know what? For their survival, they have to function together. To take down a buffalo, metaphorical or actual, you have to function together because left on your own device, left by yourself, you will get gored and die. Mm. And so every wolf in that pack has a different job duty or function. You have beta wolves, alpha wolves, caretaker wolves, scout wolves. You, They all have a job. There really is no such thing as lone wolves. Lone wolves are wolves that have been culled from the the pack and they go off on their own and die. And so when you realize that your success hinges on the success of others, it makes you more apt to sacrifice and go the extra mile for somebody else. It makes you more apt to, and to, to really want to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And that set the stage for the pack and uh, just some really prolific teams and offenses and something that I've shared from, coast to coast over the years there's teams from high school little league to professional baseball using the pack and uh it's something that i'm really super proud of when i think when i hear the pack i think of john 15 where it says no greater love there is no greater love than to lay down one life one's life for one's friends do you kind of instill that into yes the way you coach as well into the coaching philosophy of laying down your life for the other person so the two questions or really the one question I get asked the most is how, how do you guys do what you do? And, and there's really, it's a, it's a two part answer. One is this program lives by Matthew nineteen twenty six. So Jesus looked at him and he said, yep, you're right with, with man, this would be impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So we have this dreamer spirit, man, this, this spirit in us that says, you know what? It's all possible. It's only impossible until somebody does it. Right. And so we live by that. And then secondly, we're, if we live by that, we're founded on John 15, 13. There's no greater honor than the sacrifice for a brother. So we've built this culture of service and overachievement, man. And it's really something special to behold. That's awesome. Now, God has opened up a lot of doors in these past, really this past year, but even these past four or five years, like you said, for just his name to be glorified through your life. And now you're sharing your story, speaking engagements, opportunities to go to churches and share. Is this something you enjoy, want to do more of? You know, what's you you said you heard God say to you last year where you felt it in your spirit in the dugout. Tell my tell your story. Is that something that's been intentional for you since then? It really has. I look at it like this. I've got no choice, man. I've got no choice. I was dead. When you have to sleep with your four-year-old daughter because you want to die so you can feel her heartbeat and you're like, man, I can't leave this little girl. Hmm. When you're that dead and like Jesus told Lazarus, get up, come on out of there. That was me. And so... I'm unafraid. I've seen death. I'm unafraid. And I will I will spread his word, his glory, his love, his redemption through the platform that he has blessed me with until he lets me know it's time to do something else. 
It's really good. Coach Matt, we're going to finish with this. We asked this to all of our guests here uh, on the podcast. I wonder where, where your answer might go because of what you've been through in the last year and the last five years. But what have you been learning from the Lord? What is what is God teaching you during this season that you're in, during this time of your life? What are you learning from God? This is the number one thing I've learned, okay? And it's it's something that you don't think about. The only thing that separates you right now from God's will is action. Hmm. And what I learned through everything is this. God's not going to save you. You can pray all you want. But if you pray all you want and you keep living the same life or the same lie or the same old way, you got to remember this. Darkness does not live in the light. Darkness, by its very definition, is nothing. It's an absence of light. It wasn't until I stood up and I took a single step of action. And then I tied my faith to that action. And so it became this faith plus action. And I realized God was standing there the whole time and he snatched me up and he's never let go. And so the only thing that separates you from the life you want is you taking action and having faith in the Lord. Well, they always say we're, we're, they know us by our love and by our fruit, right? That's where the fruit comes Amen. from. The fruit is the action, right? Amen. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Listen, this has been great to talk to you, Matt Degg, Sam Houston State baseball coach. His new book, 15 to 28, A Story of God's Love, Power, and Redemption, is out now. Make sure you pick it up. I'm excited to read it. Excited you can for... get that, Jason. Yeah, tell me that. The place to get it is coachdegs.com. Okay, coachdegs.com. Make sure you go there. You can order it through there and all that, too, and see your speaking engagements. And obviously, the season. The season's under. We also have, have another the, job, right? <laughs> yeah, we've got the we've got the season right around the corner. There's a lot of interest in the pack mentality. I have a series of videos on that website. That's great. Uh, we've got the book. Uh, I'll close with this. Yeah. If God opens a door, if you're truly submersed in His Word and His will, and He opens a door, don't hesitate. Don't walk through it. Run through it. Run through it, yeah. And that's the action that I'm talking about. That's so good. He Jason, is you're a uh, true pro, man. Thank yeah, man, I appreciate you. You thank made you. it easy. Thank you so much, Matt Diggs. We appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah, brother, anytime. And we do thank Coach Matt Diggs, Sam Houston State baseball coach, for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. And, and Coach Diggs has this new book, 15 to 28, A Story of God's Love, Power, and Redemption. It's out now. And we're going to give away a copy right now. Here's how you're going to do it. Very easy to do. Go leave a review on iTunes. Just go to iTunes, which are where most people listen to this podcast. Go leave a review. And when you do that, either screenshot it, take a picture of it, or just email me, jason at sportspectrum.com, and let me know that you left a message and a review on iTunes. When you do that, you're entered. And we'll take maybe the first 10 entries for this, and we'll put them in a hat. I'll have my daughter pick it out. And the winner will get the copy of the new book, 15 to 28, Coach Matt Degg's new release that just came out uh, earlier this year in 2018. So if you want to win a copy of the book, very easy. Just leave a review on iTunes. Send me an email, jason at sportspectrum.com, jason at sportspectrum.com, and let me know that you left that review on iTunes, and you'll be entered in to win a copy of Coach Matt Degg's new book, 15 to 28. Thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast. We appreciate it. You can always reach us, like I mentioned, on email, jason at sportspectrum.com. You can also go to Twitter, at sports underscore spectrum. You can go to Facebook and Instagram as well. And just, you know, if you like this podcast, go tweet it out. Go put it out onto your Facebook page. Put it out on Instagram and let everyone know that you enjoy this podcast and that you want them to listen to it because that's what we're trying to do here is just tell stories of sports and faith and have as many people be inspired and encouraged as possible thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time right here on the sports spectrum podcast